From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. After a relatively quiet few months, the Atlantic hurricane season is heating up. How state officials are preparing if Rhode Island is impacted then. Coming up for air on the massive release of documents from the 38 Studios lawsuit. A reporter's roundtable on what we've learned so far on the second half of Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Joining me on the second half will be Michelle Smith from the Associated Press and Ed Fitzpatrick from the Providence Journal. But with me now on the panel is WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Peter, welcome back to the program. It's good to have you and we appreciate you being here because we know you're uh, very, very busy. So thank you for coming in. Anytime. An important note to our viewers here, we are taping this on a Friday morning. So uh, we know where Joaquin is now, but that's obviously going to change in the next 24, 36, 48 hours. Make sure that you're tuning into Eyewitness News. You're going on to WPRI.com and I highly recommend our weather app, our pinpoint weather app to track where Joaquin is as we ask those, these questions, keep that in mind. Peter, something that struck me last time we had you on the program, which was only a month ago, um, Ted and I were talking to you about how quiet the hurricane season is so far, and you pointed out, hey, look, it only takes one, and, and here we are. As we talk, Joaquin seems to be tracking eastward. Again, that could change in the next three days, but does that sort of lull people into a sense of complacency? Are you worried about that? Uh, we are, and uh, you know, as a state, uh, until we're really confident that uh, Joaquin is well past us, you know, we're going to have our foot on the gas to make sure that we're properly prepared. Uh, so some of the products that the National Weather Service puts out, uh, the cone, uh, that's all modeling and it's all, uh, you know, there's some science to it, but again, it's a prediction. Uh, and, and we use that for planning purposes, uh, but, but that cone represents uh, the tropical storm being in that 70% of the time, 30% of the time, that track would be outside the cone. So if you look at the cone today, yeah. uh, it's very close to New England, and so uh, we're going to treat it just like it was coming straight at Rhode Island. When a storm like Joaquin is churning out in the Atlantic, um, and there are several different scenarios, walk us through how how you're briefed in terms of how often, who you're on with conference calls, what kind of contact you have with the federal government. Talk, talk to us about that. Uh, so in the state we have uh, some hurricane planning uh, documents. We have this hurricane checklist that we use. Uh, it usually starts uh, weeks out depending on, the, on how far that, that, uh, that storm is recognized. A uh, whole set of actions for departments both internally and our partners externally to go through. And so it's a, kind of a checklist you can get right down to all the things based on time and where that, that uh, either hurricane or tropical storm is located. Uh, and then as we get closer, uh, we'll have uh, regular phone uh, conference calls with the National Weather Service in Taunton. Uh, right now we're having three a day, uh, 8.15, 11.30, and 2.15. And that will continue through the weekend until, again, uh, we're confident that the, either the storm is going to bypass New England or it's going to come right at us. And if the storm tracks west? and starts coming toward us or towards the United States, do those increase with frequency? Uh, I, I, most likely, yes. Uh, and I think we've been on calls where we've had done four or five a day, to can, depending what the, what the hazard is. Uh, right now, two a day, uh, three a day are, are probably the norm. Uh, a lot of uncertainty with this storm. Uh, it's really been sitting uh, stationary for the most, uh, right. most part, not going anywhere. Uh, still 135 miles an hour, three miles an hour forward speed. Uh, again, has a long distance to travel uh, to be of, of uh, little concern to us. But again, a lot of things could happen. Those models, they run them three or four times a day. So what it looks like today, uh, it may not be exactly what we get uh, come Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. You so, really got a feel for the Bahamas. It's like a, a relative you don't want in your house anymore. Yeah. It's just been hanging out yeah, forever yeah. over there. You, um, when, you're, when you're doing these briefings, I think we always see when a storm is here, the governor's out front right. making the, doing press conferences, announcing this and that and the other thing. How much do you need the involvement of, whether it's Governor Raimondo, Governor Chafee, Governor Kachiri, how much do you need the governor in these early stages of preparing for a storm? Or is it mostly briefing the governor and then you don't need them to make specific calls till a storm is here? Well, I, and, I, and I may have spoken about it last time that we, we've been doing exercises with uh, our partners, uh, with my staff, uh, and the governor's staff uh, as far back as July. So we've been through a couple different scenarios. Uh, the governor's been in the emergency operations center uh, twice for actual hurricane-related scenarios. Uh, we've been through some evacuation uh, scenarios uh, um, that we want to make sure we shop on our skills and everyone knows what to expect. Uh, but leadership, 
uh, is, is critical in this because, again, uh, you know, my role as emergency manager is to get all the departments to work together for a common goal. Uh, the governor is really the cheerleader to make sure that all that happens. So she's been involved from, from uh, before she took office up until today. Uh, and that will continue. Our guest is Peter Gaynor, the director of the Rhode Island Emergency Management Agency. So again, we're taping on a Friday. Uh, it's possible that w if we're going to feel the storm, it'll be the west side of the storm. So when you're looking at the storm, the left left side, and I, I know you're not a meteorologist, but each side of the storm comes with its own concerns. You have usually wind on the right, water on the, on the left. As it stands right now, what's your biggest concern um, in terms of Rhode Island localized flooding? What, what is it? Uh, so my biggest concern is making sure that, uh, again, we don't take our eye off the storm. So preparedness is really the, is the, is the, the, uh, the thing that we're trying to promote every day, and we'll do that until uh, it's well past us. Um, I, I, I think uh, uh, we'll probably see some uh, tropical storm winds. We'll probably see some rain. It's going to rain through the weekend, so it's going to be a miserable weekend uh, with or without uh, uh, Joaquin. Uh, and, and again, uh, I really want to encourage uh, whether you're a business or a resident uh, to take these actions now uh, to be prepared uh, because uh, should it come in through New England, being unprepared is really uh, not the best uh, medicine. Let me tell you though, people I think, if we're honest, glaze over sometimes about the preparedness stuff. It sounds like there's 50 steps, get the, get the batteries, get the generator, get the water, get the canned food, get the, you know, right, the nuclear shelter, you know, get it all done. Milk and bread. Milk and bread. What? If there is one, what is the number one thing? The first, someone said to you, I have limited time or I have limited availability. What's the first thing you'd say you have to, before anything else, do this to be prepared? Uh, I think uh, make sure you're aware of what's going on. So uh, whether it's TV or radio or the internet, uh, be, be aware of what is happening. Uh, and again, I think uh, we would love to empower residents and businesses to make the best decisions for themselves based on the information that they know. Uh, you know, I, I really don't want to have to direct people what to do. I want people to use their common sense uh, because they, they are informed about uh, what the hazards are, not just, not just a hurricane, but it could be something else. Uh, so again, be, being aware, staying informed is really the best thing you can do. And again, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep saying it, most of those things about being prepared in a kit are in your house somewhere. You know, collect them all up, uh, refresh your batteries, do all those kind of things that are really simple to do, low cost, and, uh, because it's best for you and your family. Is there in any emergency infrastructure Rhode Island needs or lacks, and maybe other states have, that uh, when you sit down and you're budgeting for the EMA next time, that you're gonna, you're gonna wanna make a capital expense? Uh, well, I think we've already made uh, a couple of those because, uh, and we go back to Superstorm uh, Sandy, some of the things that uh, we did not have in place for that was a mass notification system. So this past year, we, we purchased uh, Code Red, mm -hmm. which is a mass notification system, and we purchased it not only for the state, but all 39 uh, cities and towns, and we're in the process of rolling that out. Again, that's awareness, that's about staying informed, it's about us uh, being able to send messages to everyone uh, in the state about uh, what action to take or what the conditions uh, will be. Uh, I think that's probably one of the, the biggest things that we've done. Uh, uh, communications, again, we have a radio system that uh, we, we call it 800 megahertz radio system. It's really the backbone of our first responders, so police, fire, DPW, uh, and, and state agencies run on this radio system. We've taken uh, great effort over the past couple of years to make sure that thing uh, has redundancy, uh, is, is as bulletproof as we can make it, because that really is the core of how we coordinate a response should you lose uh, you know, TV, radio, all those, all those things that are in homes. I saw uh, Senator Reid mentioned uh, he was coming to see your office this week, and he mentioned that recently Rhode Island got an infusion of $7 million plus, he said, in federal funding from the Department of Homeland Security for emergency preparedness. What, where does that money end up? How, how, do you, how are you going to spend uh, that kind of resources? Majority money is, is passed through the local. So again, uh, there's a uh, award process that we go through, application process from local uh, uh, first responders. So from Fire departments were looking for uh, more radio uh, equipment uh, to hazard material uh, to training. Uh, that Homeland Security grant covers a wide range of uh, uh, capabilities that we, we pass through to locals. Uh, so again, about $3.7 million uh, that is a direct pass through to locals on, on all things that are concerned uh, both to the state and at a local level. Uh, and then we have another grant called Emergency Managed Performance Grant. Uh, that grant really supports emergency man management uh, programs in local communities. So we fund some operations and some sustainability with that. Uh, Peter, again, we're taping on a Friday. A lot of people watch this on a Sunday. Uh, so that being said, uh, you know, a lot of times before a big storm, we see 
particularly with National Grid, we stage outside help in the state. Yeah. Are you at that, is National Grid at that point now, have we already brought people in, and if not, when do you make that call? They are, and, uh, and, and they've been doing it. Uh, we actually took a trip, uh, the, the staff and I took a trip up to uh, Sutton, Mass. Uh, I call it the Home Depot of National Grid. <laughs> uh, it, they have an amazing uh, stockpile of uh, equipment for use in a normal day, but a whole dedicated uh, uh, system of parts and repair parts uh, should you have a uh, natural disaster in the state. Uh, really well stocked, really well run. Uh, it, it gave myself and the staff a real uh, 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 confidence that uh, National Grid has gone above and beyond when it comes to preparedness, especially for storms. So, so but are there outside personnel yeah. in Rhode Island staging right now uh, as we speak? Uh, uh, probably not now, but I know for a fact that they're, they're coordinating all that mutual aid. Uh, that happens, and again, uh, it, it's early because this, this storm has not moved, so uh, it all costs money, and so you want to make sure that absolutely uh, when you have to do it, you do it. But all those things are, are, are well uh, coordinated and, and really kind of done beforehand, so uh, it's just a matter of making that final phone call. Um, real quick, we have to go to a break here and cut you free, but um, hyper-specific question is about wind speed and something I, I notice you guys have to deal with a lot, uh, the bridges. What's the criteria for shutting them down, either for large trucks or passenger vehicles, and who makes that call? Uh, so the criteria is 69 miles an hour for high-profile vehicles, so 18... Sustained or gusts? Sustained. Uh, sustained at 69 for... Uh, 59 for uh, high-profile vehicles and 69 for uh, regular automobiles. Uh, the, the Bridge and Turnpike Authority, Buddy Croft and his team, uh, will, they measure that, that wind every day. Uh, they'll coordinate with the state police and they'll shut down bridges as appropriate. It really applies to all bridges. Uh, the, most, uh, the two bridges that they're most concerned with are the Pell and the Hope because right. uh, it's a different kind of construction. Uh, but there's criteria for that and uh, I actually talked to them today and, and, uh, and uh, they have no concerns as of yet that they would have to do that based on the forecast. Peter Gaynor, director of the Rhode Island Emergency Management Agency. We're going to let you get back to work. Thank you Thank for joining you. us on the program. Let me underscore what he said. Make sure you stay informed and keep an eye on Hurricane Joaquin. When we come back, a roundtable on 38 Studios. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. And joining me on the second half, we have Michelle Smith from the Associated Press and Ed Fitzpatrick from the Providence Journal. This isn't even a political roundtable, <laughs> and you're on the program. <laughs> it's nice to have you back. And Michelle, welcome to the program. Thank you. So we had one of our interns, our poor interns, calculate uh, how many pages were released by the courts this month. And he came up with 38,000, which is a bit ironic, I think, 955 pages. Uh, and uh, besides that being the worst intern assignment ever, let's talk about what we found in there. <laughs> Michelle, uh, you, uh, the Associated Press, uh, ran a story that you wrote this week that a top aide to former Governor Don Kachiri urged staffers to tout the 38 Studios deal. Explain it. Uh, well, it has to do with Amy Kemp, who now happens to be the spokeswoman for Attorney General Peter Kilmartin, who is criminally investigating the deal. Right. Back in 2010, she was the a, a very top staffer for Governor Kacheri, his spokeswoman. And uh, the day after the EDC approved the $75 million loan guarantee deal to 38 Studios, she wrote, there, there were a series of emails exchanged. She, she wrote to the EDC staff, get out there, call, talk radio, sell this deal, and uh, hit back against the criticism. And the subject line of that was? Well, it wasn't the subject line, but there was, there was a chain, and then uh, a follow -up, in a follow-up email a couple minutes later, she went after Lincoln Chafee, who was critical of the deal, and, sa and uh, said that he had lost Red Sox Nation, and then ended that with... Uh, with uh, in shilling we in trust, shilling we trust. Uh, yeah, that's said. right. So she didn't respond to your initial report. She has since uh, answered questions. She and did. She's yeah, saying that was my job. Right. She she says that was her job. It was that that her job was to do what the governor asked her to do. Um, however, in a deposition last year, she repeatedly said she couldn't remember whether the governor supported the 38 Studios it's deal or not. It's interesting too because I actually remember. 
getting one of those calls that now we know how it's, it has been funny, I think, for all the reporters, for us to see the orchestrating of responses to all of us as these emails come out. And I remember Keith Stokes, they were like, we, we want you to talk to Keith this afternoon about 38. This is back at the time Michelle's talking about, right. you know, hear about how the, the deal's better than people are saying, and, and we want to answer all your questions and everything. So that was, that was a real push at the time. And Ted, you... Um before Michelle's story, I want to point that out. You spoke with um, with the Attorney General, with mm -hmm. Peter Kilmartin. He's been getting sort of this pressure to recuse himself from this case. As Michelle points out, they're handling the criminal investigation at this point. What has he said? Well, I mean, you know, and I think the pressure there is, we did the debate last year with Dawson Hodgson and him, which this was a right. huge issue, and the fact is that Peter Kilmartin was a, was a, he was no longer high ranking when the vote on the 38 Studios loan program came through, but he had just stepped down as the number three House Democrat. He was still a state rep, and he voted for the loan authorization deal. And obviously, he's close to a lot. Of, he was close to a lot of folks in the legislature. So people are saying, should you be the one investigating, especially as we see more and more documents showing backroom dealings by members of the legislature at the says, time? And he says no. He says nope. No reason. People should look at my record. Uh, I'm not going to recuse myself. I even said to him. Uh, I said, you know, do you regret not asking more questions at the time about 38 Studios when you were a representative? And he said to me, well, 38 Studios had been a big success. You might be asking me a different question. So even now saying, you know, basically that, uh, you know, it's not my fault this thing didn't work. Maybe it could have been a big hit. And one of the themes that we're sort of seeing here, Ed, is that uh, a lot of the lawmakers, especially that were um, at the top, we saw Speaker Mattiello say this, that they felt like they might have had, and this is my words, not theirs, uh, the wool pulled over their eyes. And one of the bigger headlines, arguably, is the revelation that former House Finance Chairman Stephen Constantino is credited with now the infamous $75 million uh, amount. He's in Vermont. He released a statement that he had nothing to, to do with bringing 38 studios to Rhode Island. You satisfied with that? I mean, you know, reading through the 38,955 <laughs> pages of infuriating detail, you know, it just goes from big, huge, uh, big, huge games to a big, huge mess. And it, it's, you know, it, it just, you know, as a native Rhode Islander, I just feel like we deserve, it's a great state. We deserve better from our elected leaders. And, um, you know, it, it's not only breeding public cynicism. We lost the money. It breeds public cynicism. It makes it more difficult to attract jobs in the future. And, yeah, I, I think uh, Constantino's official statement there was one of the weakest I've seen from an official. Um, you know, he says uh, that my only involvement in the matter in Rhode Island was because of my former position in the Rhode Island legislature. That's like you saying, you know, your only involvement in the show is... <laughs> It's yeah, the, the, the key role you're playing in this <laughs> in this show, um, you know. And he and he said, uh, and then he turned around. And next step was to say, well, my superiors made me do it. You know, he, he wasn't like a backbencher mm. from Boroughville. He was the chairman of the right. powerful House Finance Committee, Hand, handpicked by Gordon Fox. I think what's interesting about there's a lot of things interesting about these documents, but I've heard some people saying, well, can't we just move on? Or you know, why are we bringing this up again? But these some of these people are still in government they're still high ranking government yes we gener we know the general outline of what happened here but as more details are coming out like what does this mean for us today and how government is working today what people are doing today in behind the scenes um, in government and one of the most depressing or alarming things I've heard in the last week and a half since all these came out is the number of people who spend a lot of time at the State House who've said to me privately, this is how it works. They said, this isn't anything strange. This isn't anything weird because of 38 Studios. They said, these are, this is the way decisions are made. This is kind of the way things are kept mm -hmm. just in leadership, the way you know all this money was put forward because people were excited about Kurt Schilling. There were a, a number of people I trust have said to me, none of this has surprised me. This is how the State House yeah, operates. I was just it, doing my job, Things like lines like that we've heard from many, many people. Mm -hmm. And i got to tell you, and I, maybe Ed, uh, all, all of you guys are getting the same thing, but I, I've gotten a number of emails uh, filing reports on 38 studios from viewers and readers who say, enough already, I, you know, we just need to move on. Kara Cromwell, who is a political strategist, wrote an editorial in the East Bay newspapers this week uh, saying we need to move on from 38 studios, get, get beyond it. But isn't that 
why this is important so we can peel back the curtain, particularly at the General Assembly, and, and see how it see how it operates. But I'd actually put that to Ed because that was that was a point of your column trying the the other day was trying to figure that out. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I shared a desire to get past it, but I think you know we're just now five years later seeing the details. We're just now getting that hood pulled back to see how it all operated and see this informal system and how it worked, and uh, we see that. Uh, trusted advisors uh, like you know Rosemary Booth Gologli and Sean Esten were ignored. We, you know, what's to prevent it from happening again? What lessons do we have we identified uh, that we've learned so we don't have you know the next 30 studios? Well, in the criminal in the criminal investigation, for example, the you know the Amy Camp, who's a top aide to Kill Martin, who's investigating it, was deeply involved in pushing it. So what does that say about how government is functioning today? I mean, right. House Speaker Mattiello was the majority leader when the bill passed. I mean, he, he said, Gordon Fox did not include me in, in information. We had a bad relationship, so I didn't know about this. And, you know, we'll take him at his word. But at the same time, he, he can't deny he was the number two House Democrat when that bill passed. Yeah, I, I think it just shows the need for greater transparency. We're only learning these details now. I mean, uh, one cause near and dear to your heart, the, the correspondence of officials, elected officials. We should see that. We should ha restore the uh, jurisdiction of the Ethics Commission over uh, state legislators and their core duties like voting so conflicts of interest can be identified and reported on. You know, we need some more sunlight and we don't have it right now. That hasn't changed in the five years since this and blew you, up. You can't believe, I mean, we, we, if we're honest, the, the figure who appears to be right at the center of this, Gordon Fox, is in prison for admitting to accepting bribes. You can't blame Rhode Islanders for wondering when there was, that was $52,000 on a liquor license. This was a $75 million deal. You can't blame people for at least wondering if there's even more to the story than what we've seen so far. As it is, just the revelations in the last few months have totally upended the original uh, timeline of this deal, which was supposed to have begun with Kachiri and Schilling meeting, and now it's Gordon Fox a year earlier almost. And, and now we're hearing from Speaker Mattiello that he wants to uh, reinvigorate the House Oversight Committee. He's calling for hearings on that. Is that an about face? Uh, what do you make of it? Uh, why do you think he's doing that? And how important is it that that committee has subpoena power? He is uh, said to me, a spokesperson, uh, spokesperson, I should say, Larry Berman said, one step at a time, I'm not sure that we're going to uh, pull the trigger on the subpoena power thing yet. Do they need it? How important is that? Ted? I think it depends on the purpose of the hearings. Like any, if you, you could have good hearings, you could have useless hearings. Are we just going to read the depositions aloud? We can all read the depositions. We're doing that now. We don't need a committee to do that. What are the, what would what is that committee going to add to the public understanding? This. What are they going to produce that will help Rhode Islanders and their colleagues? I mean, I don't think anyone has said exactly what what the purpose. But of he those. has said it's not the legislature's not an investigative body. Is this an about face? What do you make of it? What, what do you think prompted him to change his, change his mind, if you will, about this one, Ed? Well, I, I think all the revelations have just put the spotlight on this. But, you know, do we need a special prosecutor? Do we need somebody who's going to uh, have the subpoena power? I don't think this committee is going to have subpoena power unless he signs off on it. Uh, and at five years, I think John Marion said, you know, at, at five years later, it's damage control. It, it's, it's not... It's seeing what happened five years ago, and, and that's important. I think we should do that. Those those hearings are good. We should go even further. And at, you know, the, all these revelations uh, raised other questions, and we had a lot of Fifth Amendment pleas uh, that uh, questions that went unanswered. So there's still that. But also, I think we need greater oversight for the economic development tools that uh, this governor is putting in place, like this. This uh, legislature needs to uh, do a better job of its oversight role with all the millions of dollars in economic development tools we're using now, today. Marion also from Common Cause made a, a point that I, I hadn't thought a lot about, but he's right. <laughs> this shines another spotlight on how the rank and file in both in both chambers of the legislature have really given up an extraordinary amount of their independence and power to leadership. And, you know, the fact that Speaker Mattiello has a veto on a subpoena, well, that's in the House rules that his colleagues approve. The yeah. fact that, you know, they everyone but Bob Watson voted for that bill on this, just the say-so of Costantino and Fox without getting the answers that even some of them were asking for that day. I mean, you know, maybe maybe there should be a little less centralization in the assembly if people don't want this to happen again. But to make that happen, it would have to be leadership <laughs> of the assembly to to drive that train, and you don't see that happening too much. Going back to Peter Kilmartin, uh, Michelle, you know, when people talk about oh he should recuse himself, 
What would that look like, though? He is the attorney general. He's the top prosecutor. So would that mean he's hands off on anything with this if he were to agree to it? And maybe his deputy attorney general, Gerald Coyne, uh, would handle uh, any aspects of the 38 Studios case? Well, that's a question mark. I, I don't know if anyone knows exactly what that would look like. Right. There have been calls from a lot of people saying appoint a special prosecutor. Um, and, you know, if if it stays within the AG's office, I, I just I think no one really knows exactly what it would look like. Yeah, it's like. a complicated one. It is very complicated. And when you have, um, you know, he, he hasn't really answered, you know, Amy Kemp's role, like what what is she what is she doing behind the scenes in the AG's office? He says she's not been briefed on any ongoing probe, but is she fielding calls on this matter? You know, what did he know about her role on this? He hasn't answered that. So as long as those questions are out there, I think people will continue to be wondering, should we have another uh, special prosecutor? And when I spoke to Kill Martin this week about it, you know, he, he, he was not putting a timeline on it. You know, he's not saying, I mean, we're five years out now. He says, we're just, we're not gonna rush this. We're taking our time. We're looking through the documents. But I think, you know, all the people saying to us, stop covering this, well then definitely they should feel like it's time for the criminal justice system to come to a conclusion. Even if there are no charges, just announce that. But to just have it hanging on year, I mean, Gordon Fox was raided, charged, uh, pled and put in prison in a little over a year, and this thing's been hanging out there for years now. I want to thank Ed Fitzpatrick from the Providence Journal, Michelle Smith from the Associated Press, and Ted Nisi from WPRI.com. 38,955 <laughs> pages. We're covering it all. Make sure you catch us on the live blog. Michelle, Ed, have something good. You'll find it there as well. We're equal opportunity. Thanks for watching Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week.